I want to introduce the, the first speaker, Claire Parkinson, who is a colleague of mine. Uh, she is a climatologist at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and a senior fellow at the, at the same center. She reserved, uh, received her PhD from Ohio State University in, 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 and she studied uh, on many different areas of, of uh, research. Now, the, what she's going to talk about this morning is the use of, 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 of satellite remote sensing to uh, give information about uh, the uh, trends in Arctic sea ice uh, in other aspects of, of changes in the, in the land and the oceans and so forth. Uh, she has presently been the uh, project scientist for the Aqua Science Mission, which is uh, a, uh, a satellite mission launched in May of, of 2002. And that uh, uh, mission is still ongoing, and the satellite is offering very valuable information about atmospheric, ocean, land, and sea ice variables. She has written many uh, the books over the years uh, that have contributed to our understanding of, of climate and the, 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 the history of, of uh, science. So I'd like to introduce her at this point so she can get started on her talk. Claire? Uh, thank you, Warren. This year, well-deserved attention has been given to a longtime NASA employee, Katherine Johnson, uh, because of her calculations in the 1960s regarding the flights of the Mercury and Apollo astronauts. Um, Uh, she um, she did these calculations in in the 1960s and uh, has received attention because of the movie Hidden Figures and the book that it's based upon, also called Hidden Figures. Uh, Catherine is still alive. She's 98 years old, and she's an, expressed several times how thrilled she was with her entire NASA career and how privileged she felt to be a part of the grand enterprise of sending humans into space. I've been at NASA now for 38 years, and I also am thrilled to be a part of NASA, and also am thrilled to be privileged to be a part of another grand enterprise of NASA's, and that is to use satellites to observe the Earth from space and to um, quantify changes that are occurring in the climate in order to uh, benefit humanity. There are many benefits to humanity from space observations, and these are clear from things like uh, the tracking of hurricanes uh, well before they hit landfall. It's clear from things like fires uh, and oil spills and, um, and volcanic emissions, how satellites can track these things and help humanity in that way. When it comes to looking at climate, there is one severe limitation, and that is the first artificial satellite wasn't launched until 1957. And so the satellite records simply cannot go back anywhere near as far as the ice core records that Lonnie's going to be talking about or the tree ring records that Kevin's going to be talking about. And they can't provide that deep time record. Also, they can't do what the climate models can do in terms of projecting into the future. But what satellites can do, now somehow this is, uh, oops, okay. What satellites can do is take repetitive, frequent observations and can do so on a global basis. They can do this better than any other available technology. They can observe the incomes and outcomes at the top of the atmosphere. They can observe several layers within the atmosphere. They can observe the surface underneath. They can observe clouds, and they can observe through clouds with proper choice of wavelengths. The satellite measurements 
are used for all sorts of things. I'm going to concentrate on what can be used for climate change studies because of the uh, focus on this particular um, session. So I'll start with the greenhouse gases, which Warren has already started to mention. The greenhouse gases are gases that readily allow solar radiation into the surface, but they hinder Earth's radiation from getting out. This produces a natural uh, warming of the atmosphere beyond what it would be without these greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases have been vitally important to the evolution of the Earth and vitally important to having Earth habitable for these past few billion years. However, there's severe concern now that the amount of greenhouse gases that humans are adding to the atmosphere could cause much more detrimental effects than the beneficial effects. And so, uh, satellites are not able to determine whether greenhouse gases are good or bad or whether increased temperatures are good or bad, but what they can do is they can monitor the gases. The primary greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, the most abundant one, is water vapor. Greenhouse gases, uh, the water vapor from satellites are vitally important for things like weather forecasting and water management. But for climate change studies, the greenhouse gas that has received the most attention is the second most abundant greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, and that is carbon dioxide. Warren has already put up this curve from Charles David Keeling. This extends the curve to uh, 2016. And uh, the seasonal cycle and the long-term trend clearly have continued. This is a tremendous record for that one location. Satellites are able to get that information near globally. This is an animation from the Atmospheric Infrared Sounder airs instrument on the Aqua spacecraft, and the curve in white is the Mauna Loa curve that Warren was showing. So each time that curve goes up, you'll see that the colors in the background from the airs satellite are getting more toward the red end, uh, which is the higher values of CO2 concentration. So it's getting the seasonal cycle. But note also that each time it rises to a peak, there are more reds than there were the time before. So it's getting the long-term trend. So the satellite data are getting the seasonal cycle and the long-term trend, but are getting it globally. So it's a tremendous complement to the much longer record of the Mauna Loa record from the, uh, from the Keeling curve. Concern about greenhouse gases rises because of the effect on temperature. And here you can see that the satellite data from the late 1970s is definitely showing the warming trend that is referred to as global warming. This bottom curve is for the troposphere, which is the lower part of the atmosphere. The top curve is for the stratosphere, which is higher up and which has a decreasing trend. This decreasing trend in the stratosphere, increasing trend in the troposphere was predicted by the satellite, uh, by the uh, computer models. So the satellite data are confirming these results. And when looked at spatially, you could see that there's a big difference spatially in terms of where uh, the warming is most. And one of the regions of the most warming is the Arctic. This also was predicted, and the reason being feedbacks between the ice and snow cover with the climate system. And in this case, I'm illustrating with the sea ice. Sea ice is highly reflective, as is snow and land ice. Um, and so when there's warming that begins, then you're going to get melting of the ice. You're going to get less ice formed, so there's going to be sea ice retreat. But with that retreat, because of this impact of the reflectivity of the sea ice, there'll be less bouncing back to space of the solar radiation, hence reduced su surface reflectivity, more solar radiation gets absorbed and retained within the system, and therefore you get further, further warming. This is an enhancing feedback. Scientists generally refer to it as a positive feedback, 
although in this case positive does not mean good. The satellites are great in terms of being able to observe the sea ice cover. In this case, I'm showing with visible radiation, the type of radiation that our eyes see. And you could see that you could see sea ice really well with a visible instrument on a satellite as long as it's light out and there are no clouds in the way. With a visible instrument, you're gonna have the same limitations as your eyes have. So when there's a cloud in the way, you're not gonna see your data underneath. And when it's dark out, you're not gonna get your data. So in general, we don't use the visible data for our climate studies. We instead go with microwave data. Microwaves are produced within the Earth's system. And so therefore, it doesn't matter whether it's sunny out or not. And so you can get your data, whether it's dark or light. And also with proper choice of wavelengths, you can get your data uh, through a cloud cover. So we get data uh, for all, kind of all weather data all year round. This simulation goes up to the peak of this year's ice cover, which came in March, March 7th of this year. This is the lowest amount of ice in the satellite record for the peak of, of the annual uh, cycle of sea ice, and yet, even at its lowest, it's still 14.4 million square kilometers, which is well over the area of Canada, which is 10 million square kilometers, and Canada is slightly bigger than the United States. So it's a huge amount of sea ice, way more than you could really cover readily without a satellite. So we've got a record that goes back to the late 1970s, and if you plot monthly averages, as in the left plot here, it's dominated by the seasonal cycle. Although the decreases in the Arctic have accelerated so much that by now you can see the trends even with the monthly, site, monthly data. However, we do, in two different ways, remove the seasonal cycle in order to really highlight the trends. And we do that both in a process called monthly deviations and also by simply doing uh, yearly averages. Either way, we get roughly the same result of about 54,000 square kilometers a year loss of sea ice. That's roughly equivalent to the combined areas of Massachusetts and Vermont, loss of sea ice each year. We do the exact same set of calculations for Antarctica, but in this case, the results are very different. In this case, the Antarctic sea ice cover, instead of decreasing, has ov overall been increasing. This was a surprise, and scientists have spent a lot of time to try to come up with explanations of why the ice cover was increasing. But if you notice here, in the last two years, there's been a lot of decreases. Again, not totally understood yet, but certainly these decreases will help to uh, sort out which of the proposed explanations of the increases remain viable. The other type of ice on the Earth is land ice. Land ice is not as expansive as sea ice. However, it is way, way thicker. And this way uh, hugely thicker land ice cover makes it the volume of the land ice is way more than the volume of the sea ice. Land ice volume is roughly a third of what it was at the peak of the last ice age. So there's still a whole lot of ice left on the Earth, and the vast majority of it is in two locations. One, the ice sheet of Antarctica, which is covering almost the entire continent of Antarctica, and the other is the Greenland ice sheet, which is covering almost the entire island of Greenland. These are huge. Greenland ice sheet, a large area of the Greenland ice sheet, the ice is over a mile thick. Antarctic ice sheet, large areas over two miles thick. So a huge amount of ice. Enough ice in these two locations that if all that ice were to go into the oceans, sea level would rise roughly 65 to 70 meters. So huge, huge amount of ice left on the Earth. And indeed, satellites are measuring this ice cover in many different ways. Uh, with visible radiation, you can see things that are visible, such as the breaking off 
of an iceberg. And here, this iceberg breaking off is twice the size of Delaware. So a huge piece of ice breaking off the Antarctic ice sheet. On the right is a picture from a different technology, which is altimetry. An altimeter sends a signal down, receives it back, and determines the topography of the surface underneath by how long it takes the signal to get back. And there are two types of altimeters that have been used for ice sheet studies. The one sends a radar signal down, the other a laser. The results here in the right picture are from a laser altimeter on the ICESAT satellite. And uh, when you take these results of the elevation of the ice sheet and compare them one year to another and one decade to another, you can see changes. And you can also see similar changes with an entirely different type of technology, which is the GRACE satellite, which is measuring gravity. Gravity measurements This uh, come from a pair of satellites that are about 200 and 20 kilometers apart, and there is no instrument on these satellites that's pointed toward the Earth. That makes it an extremely unusual satellite for Earth observations. So there's no instrument pointing toward the Earth. Instead, the instruments are pointing at each other, and they're keeping track of how far apart the two satellites are as one trails the other. And as you go over a field with heavy gravity, then the first one speeds up and the distance gets a little longer. And then it comes back together again as the second one goes over the field. So what, these, what the scientists do who use the GRACE data for ice sheet studies is they take these measurements of the distance, they convert that to a gravity measurement, and then they convert the gravity measurement into a measurement of how much mass was either lost or gained in the ice sheet underneath. So it's a very complicated set of calculations, but the results come out really nicely matching the results that come out from the altimeter data. And in particular, the results for Greenland show a thickening of the Greenland ice sheet in the center of the ice sheet and a thinning around the edges. The results for Antarctica show some thickening in the main portion of the Antarctic ice sheet, but a great deal of thinning along the Antarctic Peninsula, and in particular in the Thwaites and, and Pine Island Glacier regions. When the results are compiled and plotted as a time series, the Greenland ice sheet shows a strong seasonal cycle, but a very prominent downward trend in the amount of ice. The Antarctic ice sheet doesn't have as much of a seasonal cycle, but the result is clearly a very strong downward trend. The reason people are really concerned about what's happening with the ice sheets is because of the potential of sea level rise. And indeed, satellites are able to measure the sea level rise also. These are results from a satellite that, a uh, uh, sequence of satellites that are radar altimeters uh, starting in 1992. And they show the spatial distribution of sea level rise and sea level falls. So there have been some regions with sea level falls which are in blues in this plot, but you can see that there are far more regions and far deeper, uh, far higher values for sea level rise. So when you take the global picture and plot the global picture from the satellite data, you can, it's a very strong upward trend in sea levels, it's about 3.4 centimeters per year. So a dominant upward trend. And for my last main example, before I go to my conclusions, for the last main example, I, I'm going with uh, returning to the atmosphere and looking at the ozone hole. The ozone hole is often not considered as part of climate change. However, uh, even though it's created from a very different process, which is re, uh, chemical reactions in the upper atmosphere, those chemical reactions are producing changes in the circulation of the upper atmosphere, which end up affecting the circulation of the lower atmosphere, and which end up affecting many other aspects of the climate system. So when you look at pictures of the ozone hole from satellite data, it doesn't 
it's not immediately apparent that there's been progress since the remarkable 1987 Montreal Protocol where the nations of the world did come together and to protect the ozone layer, they did agree to reduce chlorofluorocarbons. And it was known that the results would not be immediate because chlorofluorocarbons, which are the ozone depleting substances that humans release and that get up into the stratosphere. So it, it, those stay for quite a while in the atmosphere. And so therefore, everybody knew that the recuperation would not be immediate. However, when you plot the progress, you can see progress has been made. And the progress is clear from the area of the ozone hole. It had been going up really rapidly, and then it leveled off since the early 1990s. And the depth of the ozone hole, meaning how deep does the ozone get, had been going down, and then it leveled off, and in fact has uh, recouped a little bit. The calculations indicate that full recuperation of the ozone hole back to 1980 levels might come in about the year 2070. So that's an estimate from the calculations. Now, to the conclusions. Uh, the satellite data do have many problems, and in the written version of this talk, I do list many of the limitations of the satellite data in addition to the main one that I've already mentioned, which is that they don't go back far enough. However, what the satellite data do do for us is they essentially level the playing field of data collection so that you can get your data in the middle of the Pacific just as easily as in San Francisco Bay. In fact, even easier because you don't have the land contamination problem. You can get your data in the cold, dark time frame of the Arctic winter just as easily as in the much more pleasant conditions of spring and summer. You can get your data in the Sahara Desert and in the uh, Amazon rainforest without having to go and suffer the conditions of those locations or harming them in any way. So the satellite data are doing a tremendous job in getting a record that just could really not be collected any other way. However, um, they do have the time limitation. But even with that limitation, I've been able to show in this talk, in just the short amount of time I've got, been able to show from satellite data the increases in carbon dioxide, the global warming increases of temperature in the troposphere, the decreasing temperatures in the stratosphere, decreases in Arctic sea ice, increases in Antarctic sea ice, decreases in the masses of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets, increases in sea level rise, and decreases in ozone up until the mid or early 1990s, and then essentially a leveling off since then. So, um, so the satellite data are showing us a lot. However, the, those data are not nearly enough for what we need to understand the Earth's climate. We need the anecdotal records, we need the instrumental records, we need the uh, ice core records that Lonnie's about to talk about, we need the um, tree ring records that Kevin's about to talk about, we need the other paleoclimate data sets, and we also need the computer models that Warren has worked on for so many years and that allow us to sophisticated peering into cause and effect and also allow us to project into the future. All of these data sets are important. All of them are providing critical information, both for us as scientists to better understand the system, but also for us to be able to give to the policymakers and society at large the information they need in order to make informed decisions about what to do uh, to protect this, this singular isolated dot in the vastness of space, 
the Earth, the amazing pale blue planet that is so far our only home. Thank you. questions and uh, I see one right here one over here um, could you put up the sea level rise one again because you said three centimeters per year and oh I I'm sorry if I said that it was do you mean three was millimeters three, it, per no, year? it was 3.4 centimeters per decade so, um, so it's three I, millimeters I, I, per year pardon three millimeters per year yes 2.4 okay. millimeters per year. I'm very sorry if I messed oh, that up. Okay, I, but, I, yeah. I, I was surprised by the Yeah, recall. it's 3.4 centimeters per decade, so 34 centimeters a century. And then Thank the other you for question. The correction. I, yeah, and the other question was with regard to whether it's accelerating or slowing down. Um, my reading of your figure is that it's accelerating slightly and there's other tidal gauge information which gives a similar result. But Steve Coonan, a distinguished scientist, maybe in the room, argues the contrary, that the sea level rises is slowing. Do you have any idea what's the basis of this and, and what is the correct answer? Well, it certainly doesn't look like it's slowing from this picture. Uh, but um, I don't know what he's basing his results on. So just from this picture, I would say it definitely does not look like it's slowing. Uh, the uncertainties are very diff difficult to... Uh, certainly there are uncertainties that are large, but I, I would not be able to you know, give an exact number there on the uncertainties, but certainly the uncertainties are large on all of the data sets. And that's part of the reason why it's so important to get a number of different data sets in order to see how well they match each other. You know, like with the GRACE satellite and the altimetry for the ice sheets, to see that those are really matching pretty well, even though it's an incredibly different type of technology that's being used, one with the altimeter and one with this uh, gravity measurement. So it's hugely different technology and yet both getting the same picture. And so that's a critical aspect of, of it. I have a question. Jane Shop from UCLA. My question is, with the uh, reduced reflectivity, increase of CO2 getting into the ocean, you have measurement of the acidity of the ocean? Yes, there are some measurements of the acidity of the ocean, not from satellite data. The satellite data do show some salinity of the ocean, but the acid co content is uh, not directly measured by the satellites yet. Uh, the acidity issue is a big issue, and it's one of the reasons why people who try to deal with the climate question simply by doing some scheme to reduce temperatures in the atmosphere are not dealing with the whole problem because the acidity in the oceans is a whole nother issue that's definitely causing problems to the life in the oceans. Another question. You mentioned heavy gra gravity. How is heavy gravity generated? Um, I, I simply meant the gravity field underneath was uh, higher than elsewhere. I mean, it, if I use the term heavy, uh, that might have been the wrong term, it's but I, I simply meant that as it's going over and it's measuring the gravity underneath and the gravity underneath 
varies in location. So when it's got a stronger gravity field, then the satellite speeds up. And the other satellite is coming behind it. And so when that gets over that stronger gravity field, it speeds up and the distance between the satellites gets back to what it had been before. So the distance is varying depending on the gravity field below. And how does the depth of the ozone, <clears throat> ozone uh, ring affects temperature? Does it have any effect? The depth, you say there is an increase in the depth of the ozone ring, but not, but not the, the size of the ring. No, there's, there's the, the size has been increasing. So the area of the ozone hole increased until the early 1990s. And then it's leveled off since then. And the expectation is that it's going to recoup and go back up again. Uh, uh, well, the area will go down, but then the depth that you're asking about is how low do the ozone hole values get. So the ozone hole is called a hole, but it's not a real hole in terms of its lower ozone values, but they don't get down to zero. And so the depth simply means how low are those values. And Okay. Uh, Bill Hook from Alexandria, Virginia. Claire, thank you for an excellent overview. I, I really enjoyed it. I, I wonder, you talked about the, chal the deficit associated with the fact you can only go back in history so far. Could you talk a little bit about the importance of continuous records going forward? and what NASA's plans are to maintain continuity of these records or maybe expand what we're looking at. Okay, continuous records going forward are extremely important. Each time that there's a change in an instrument, it really takes a great deal of effort to get the data sets matched. And so it's really important to try to get continuous records and in fact to try to have at least a year overlap between one instrument and the follow-on instrument for it. NASA would like to have these records be continuous. However, NASA basically isn't the agency that's supposed to do the development work, the research work. Once a measurement is ready to be operational, then it transitions either to NOAA or the Department of Defense. And so NASA's doing kind of the new measurements and then they get operational, it goes to NOAA or the Department of Defense. NASA works very closely with NOAA and both are concerned about trying to maintain these records as uh, continuous records. I should point out that in the, in the president's budget, he has essentially cut out the, the uh, NOAA satellites for at least a few years. So that we could have even a more, uh, a, a larger gap in between the, on the data that comes from the, the on NASA satellites and, and NOAA picking up those measurements. Joel Cohen from New York City. Thank you for a beautiful talk. Could you explain for the naive listener like me, what is the significance of the rising trend in temperature in the lower atmosphere and the falling trend in the stratosphere and the green, uh, Greenland l losing ice and Antarctica gaining ice? How, how do we think, how should I think about these countervailing trends in different places, please? Okay, the um, first one is actually, I'm pleased that you asked that because uh, there we go is the picture. Uh, I was, the 
the increases in the troposphere are the standard thought of greenhouse gases get added to the lower atmosphere. They're allowing the Earth's uh, sun's radiation to get through. They're hindering the Earth's radiation from getting out. And so therefore, the system warms. That same phenomenon is what is also causing the decreases in the, in the upper atmosphere. And if you think about it, that makes sense because if these greenhouse gases in the lower atmosphere are preventing the Earth's radiation from getting out, they're also preventing the Earth's radiation from getting to the upper atmosphere. And so therefore, this contrast really does make some sense. Now, also on this plot, I do point out the two major volcanic eruptions, El Chichan and Mount Pinatubo, that occurred in the satellite record. And this addresses this issue also of the contrast between the upper and the lower atmosphere. When these emissions from major, volcan major explosive, vertically explosive volcanoes, when the emissions from those get up into the stratosphere, they are going to warm the stratosphere. However, they also are going to prevent the sun's radiation from getting down through the stratosphere into the troposphere. And so therefore, even though it's not as prominent, you can see that with both eruptions, there was a cooling in the troposphere just when there's the warming in the stratosphere. This cooling in the troposphere with the Mount Pinatubo eruption in uh, the early 1990s, immediately climate scientists said the warming next year is not going to be at the level that it would have been without this volcanic eruption. And indeed, the data show that that's the case. So that contrast is understandable and clear. Now, another one that you mentioned was the contrast between well, you said Greenland and Antarctica, but the Greenland and Antarctica, uh, in terms of the ice sheets, they're both losing, they're both losing mass from these plots. So they're both, they're not opposites. The opposite case was the sea ice instead. So in the sea ice case, uh, around the Arctic and the Antarctic sea ice, the Arctic sea ice is definitely decreasing. The Antarctic sea ice has this increase and the Arctic decreases were very understandable because the Arctic has had a whole set of complementary changes that all match. Uh, warming of the Arctic, sea ice decreases, land ice decreases, permafrost thawing. So a whole set of changes in the Arctic that are really quite uniform. In the Antarctic case, the sea ice increase was unexpected by most people. And so it created a lot of effort to try to explain it. Everybody knew that when you've got global warming, it's not going to be the entire globe that warms at once. There are going to be some regions that cool. In Antarctica, the sea ice region happened to be one of those regions that cooled. But a lot of attempts to try to explain why. And some of the attempts look at atmospheric circulation factors. Some look at ocean circulation factors. Some look at the melt from the Antarctic ice sheet, and they say that the melt from the Antarctic ice sheet is pouring very cold water into the ocean, and therefore it can cool. Some even tie it to the ozone hole. However, the last two years have shown this huge decrease, and now all these theories of why it was increasing have to be reevaluated in terms of the new data. Okay. Hi, Bill Brinkman. Uh, just one question. Uh, one of the more controversial aspects of this whole subject is is the actual energy deficit, uh, the ba energy balance deficit, right? And, and, and you know, it's a very small number on, on the total energy coming in and going out. The question I have is, do you think it will ever be possible to use satellites to actually measure that number? It has been measured, and uh, it's the uh, series, which is CERES, the Clouds and the Earth's Radiant Energy System, uh, the science team for that particular instrument has done measurements of the incoming radiation from another source, from another uh, satellite that's looking toward the sun. And 
than the outgoing radiation, both from reflected solar radiation and also from Earth's terrestrial radiation going out. And they have made very finely tuned calculations. They do get the expected energy imbalance at the top of the atmosphere. So those, those measurements have been made. It's a team at, uh, that's centered at NASA's Langley uh, uh, Research Center. So, um, and it's the, the series science team. I think I have to uh, bring this to an end.